This summer, Turkey had an attempted state coup. This was turned down, but Turkey responded afterwards by derogating, meaning making exceptions, from pretty much all of its human rights obligations. When can a state deviate from human rights obligations because of matters of state security? On Guantanamo Bay, the Americans are keeping prisoners without any judgment, without any procedural guarantees, because they are suspected terrorists. Can suspected terrorists be exempt from human rights guarantees? Can they be exempt from procedural guarantees? Can they be prevented from having their case heard before the court? Russia has major security issues such as in Chechnya and other regions. How can Russia respond to such security considerations without violating human rights? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ketil Mujinic Larsen. I'm professor of law at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights at the University of Oslo, where I'm also the deputy director. Apart from that, I don't think I'll introduce myself much more, but rather let my words do the introduction. I will speak this morning about human rights and national security. I am a lawyer by profession, so this will be a somewhat more law technical presentation than other presentations you are hearing. But please bear with me and I'll try to set the scene, set the legal framework for the rest of this day. Human rights and national security are very much intertwined. They are linked. You cannot have one without the other. You need one to protect the other. <coughs> A third concept that goes in the middle here and which will be the focus of other presentations today is the rule of law. I will not address the rule of law in any particular uh, manner, but I will just introduce it in the beginning. Rule of law is a concept that requires protection of human rights in order to exist. A simple definition of the rule of law is that nobody is above the law, but also nobody is excluded from protection of the law. No one can be judged by court unless the law says that he should be judged. And nobody can be judged in a manner by procedures not uh, prescribed in the law itself. These procedural guarantees, these uh, guarantees by being equal before the law, are important features in the rule of law, but they are also important human rights. You need to protect human rights to have a functioning rule of law. And I'll come back a little bit on how this relationship is. But I will focus on human rights and national security. If you don't have a national security, if you don't have a stable, secure, safe state, you will not be able to protect human rights. Human rights protection, promotion, is dependent on a secure, stable, safe state. That is one basic premise. You need national security. But also, if you don't protect human rights, you will not attain national security. You cannot have a stable, safe, secure state if you don't protect, at least to a certain degree, the human rights of the population. Because denying the population human rights will lead to uproar, it will lead to unrest, it will lead to revolution, which again threatens national security. So without human rights, no national security. These two are very much dependent on each other. What is important then for the state, for every state, for Russia and for every other state in the world, is of course to find the balance. How do you balance considerations of human rights with in, uh, considerations relating to national security? How can you ensure proper protection of human rights while still maintaining a proper 
degree of national security. Let's begin with the concept of national security. In human rights terms, you can even say that every human being has a human right to national security. National security is not only a matter of state interest, it is also a matter of individual interest. You have an interest in your state being stable, in your state being secure. And this human right to national security is not a new invention. This is centuries old, developed hundreds of years ago by some of the most prominent thinkers we have. I know that tomorrow you will have a presentation on uh, Thomas Hobbes and uh, John Locke. So uh, to draw some lines, Hobbes developed ideas about the social contract back in the 17th century. His idea was that you need a stable state, uh, you need to get away from the natural state, state of nature, because in nature, in anarchy, human life would be short, it would be brutal, it would be solitary, it would be poor. You need a state to guarantee human freedom, to guarantee human development. You need a social contract between the individuals and the state. The state will protect you, but it will not abuse you. John Locke developed these ideas further in the same century, the 17th century. He developed the ideas that individuals' obligations to obey the state only goes if the state offers you security in return. If the state fails to offer you security, you do not any longer have any obligations to obey the state. You then have a right to revolt, a right to uh, call for reforms. But if the state offers you security, you have a duty to obey the state. These thoughts have also been developed further in more contemporary thinking, such as the le legal philosophers John Rawls and Ronald Dworkin who have operated uh, last century, primarily up to the 2000s. They have developed ideas, thinking, principles on how to balance individual interests and community interests in a right to security. You cannot focus solely on human rights, as some human rights activists, some human rights scholars, some liberal human rights uh, thinkers do, because you need to balance human rights, individual human rights, with community interests state interests. Um, and only if you find that proper balance do you have the maximum, the optimal protection of human rights while still maintaining national security. National security strategies yeah. and national authorities will of course provide you with a slightly different narrative. National security strategies will say that national security is the state's primary responsibility. National security is what the state primarily should promote. Human rights is something secondary. It can only prom promote human rights to the extent that it does not go against considerations of uh, national security. In its uh, national security strategy from 2010, the United Kingdom says this explicitly. Security of our nation is the first duty of the government. It is the foundation of our freedom and our prosperity. Japan has the same um, kind of wording. Maintaining the peace and security of Japan and ensuring its survival are the primary responsibilities of the government of Japan. No mention of human rights in those kinds of statements. The United States has the similar, Russia has something similar. But you cannot have this as the only focus. It may well be the primary focus, but it needs to be checked. It need, needs to be weighed against other considerations, primarily than human rights. Now, what are human rights? 
I always give this picture to my students because everybody knows what this is. This is an elephant. Then I ask my students, can you define an elephant? Nobody manages to do that. Human rights is something similar. We know intuitively what human rights are, but it's inherently difficult to define human rights. A natural definition of human rights is that human rights are those values that every human being has already by virtue of being human. Something inherent in uh, every human being, something that is given to us by something outside of humans themselves. Whether you call that nature or God or morale doesn't matter, but something that exists outside humans have given humans their rights. Lawyers, such as myself, tend to have a more uh, positive way of addressing this. Human rights are those norms we find in international human rights conventions. We won't go into that, but let's just accept that human rights may be something vague, something unclear, but we will focus on the positivized, codified human rights norms that national security needs to be based against. Human rights, per definition, are universal. They are indivisible, they are interdependent, and they are interrelated. Human rights are universal, they apply to all human beings. Whether you are a terrorist, whether you are a refugee, whether you are a child, whether you are disabled, human rights apply to everyone. Human rights are indivisible, meaning that all human rights apply to all human beings. No human can be deprived of his human rights. Human rights are interdependent. You cannot promote one human right and disregard another. They are mutually dependent of each other and they are interrelated. They must be seen in relation to each other. Human rights are protected on different levels. They're protected on national level, through constitutions, through national laws, through regulations, through national court decisions, administrative practice, budgetary allocations, and so on. The primary protector of human rights is the national state. Accepting, however, that the national state is not always perfect in its protection of human rights, we also have protection at the regional level, with regional human rights conventions providing legally binding obligations for states within that region. For us in this room, it's the European Convention on Human Rights, which is by far the most important of these regional conventions. But there are others, such as the European Social Charter, providing socio-economic rights, to individuals within Europe. Also, the Convention on Pre <coughs> Prevention Against Torture is a regional convention relevant for our topic today. We also have human rights protection on the international level, primarily through the United Nations, which has core human rights conventions dealing with civil and political rights, socio-economic rights, torture, the rights of women, the rights of children, the rights of disabled persons, and so on. There are nine core international conventions, of which Russia has ratified quite many. And these levels of human rights protection are necessary to provide <coughs> checks and balances to the state's pursuit of national security they will limit what the state can and should do in its search for the best possible national security. This is a distinction we also find on the international level. The United Nations has two main purposes In Article 1 of the United Nations Charter, we find that the United Nations shall protect and promote international peace and security, but also that the, that the United Nations should promote respect for fundamental human rights. 
we find that all ready there on the international level. On the international arena, this distinction is seen in somewhat different concepts than what we see on the national arena. Internationally, there are some concepts that are useful to be aware of for the topics this uh, today. First of all, the so-called responsibility to protect that I will come back to shortly, meaning that international community has a responsibility to react against gross human rights violations anywhere in the world, regardless of considerations of national integration, uh, uh, national integrity, sorry, and national security. We have a distinction internationally between national and human security, which I'll also come back to shortly. Security does not only mean national security, it means also security of the individual, which is a quite different concept and which is something the state also has an obligation to protect. The third concept I'll mention very briefly is the so-called protection of civilians concept that has been developed within the United Nations framework. This is concept applicable, for instance, in international peace operations, which they relatively often, not always, but often, are given mandates to protect civilians under threat of physical attack. So on the international arena, we have obligations to protect individuals against human rights abuse. Just to illustrate the distinction between national security and human security. National security is the traditional way of thinking. The state has an obligation and the right to take measures to protect its national integrity, its territorial integrity, its political independence, etc. Human security has the individual as a focus. It's the integrity of the individual that is the primary purpose of this concept. Human security is about protecting individuals against disease, against poverty, against violence, against environmental damage, etc. It's about keeping individuals safe, keeping them secure from threats against their daily life. In human rights documents, we see this human security already in the earliest uh, documents. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 speaks partly of the right to security of a person, the right to liberty, the right to security, physical integrity, it speaks also of the right everyone as a member of society has to social security that should have some minimum social safeguards. And that everyone has the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, etc. So see these ideas on human security already in the earliest human rights documents. Human security was developed as concept in 1994 under the UN Development Program, which developed a human development report in 1994, identifying seven uh, levels of human security relating to economic security, food security, health security, environmental security, physical security, community security, and political security. So see, these are quite different concepts from national security, which relates to security from interstate wars, security from nuclear proliferation, security from revolution internally, etc. National security, as we see, is both outwards looking, the security of a state against threats from other states, whereas it also has an in inwards looking aspect, security within its borders, security against internal threats such as revolution, such as terrorism and uh, other aspects. Human security is also both outwards looking and inwards looking. It's about against protecting individuals from threats 
uh, from others, but also about enabling the individual to live in good health, live in freedom, uh, and uh, counter the more internal uh, issues within each individual. Responsibility to protect is a different concept. We say that the responsibility to protect is a concept with three pillars and four crimes. What does this mean? The three pillars... Sorry. The three pillars are first the responsibility to protect. This refers to the obligation every single state has to protect individuals within <coughs> its territory. The state has the primary responsibility to protect individuals within its ter territory. If a state is un unable to do so, the international community has the responsibility to assist, which, which is the second pillar. The responsibility to assist states in becoming able to secure the individuals within its borders. Through capacity building, through development, through cooperation, etc. Only if that does not work, if the state is unwilling or still unable to protect civilians within its borders, the international community has a responsibility to react in the international community through the United Nations Security Council, has the responsibility to intervene if necessary with military means to protect civilians against uh, human rights violations such as in Syria, a typical example, where the international community has a responsibility, not necessarily a legal obligation, but a responsibility to react to protect Syrian civilians from continued <coughs> human rights violations. But this applies for only four different crimes, only if a civilian population is being subject to war crimes, to ethnic cleansing, to crime, crimes against humanity or uh, against gen genocide. Only then does the international community have this responsibility to react against human rights violations. So this is a high standard. So that is how the distinction between human rights and uh, national security sorry, looks on the international arena. How does it then look on the national arena? What is the relevant the concepts within Russia, within other states. Russia, as other states, have international human rights obligations. <coughs> Russia is, for example, bound by the European Convention on Human Rights, which is supervised by the European Court of Human Rights, which can issue legally binding judgments against the member states. And the European Court of Human Rights has issued a lot of binding judgments against Russia, also for mistreatment of su suspected security threats. <laughs> Russia is bound by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the main United Nations Convention protecting civil and political rights, such as physical integrity, such as the right to life, etc. Russia is also bound, against, uh, bound by the United Nations Convention Against Torture, which is the most important international framework for prohibiting, preventing, reacting against acts of torture by the state. And Russia is also bound by the Council of Europe Convention for the Prevention of Torture, establishing mechanisms for international supervision of detainment facilities, prisons, mental hospitals, etc., <coughs> where torture often takes place, uh, developing mechanisms for uh, preventing torture in such facilities. But how does this translate then into rights for the individual man and woman? What are the rights that are protected? And how do these relate to national security? The main problem in practice is, of course, that a state, under the excuse of having a national security threat, will uh, 
limit human rights of individuals. Through surveillance, through imprisonment of security threats, by taking away civil liberties of individuals. Do they have to do this within the limits set forth by international conventions? Every human being has an inherent right to life. This not, does not mean, however, that the state can never kill anyone, but it means that the state cannot do this arbitrarily. The European Convention says that the state cannot deprive anyone of their life unless it's absolutely necessary to do so to achieve legal, uh, some legitimate purpose, <coughs> such as <coughs> killing someone if it's absolutely necessary to prevent that person from killing others. This needs to be done in accordance with law, it needs to follow procedural guarantees and needs to be absolutely necessary. There is an absolute prohibition against torture. The state can never, ever, under any circumstance, during war or peacetime, torture anybody. This is one of the few absolute rules. It does not matter whether you are a terrorist. It does not matter whether you are a suspected terrorist. It does not matter whether you are a mass murderer. It does not matter, matter whether you have placed a bomb at a po heavily populated square and the, the police needs to find out where this bomb is. You cannot torture individuals under any circumstance. <coughs> Even if national security considerations would motivate you to do so. Every human being has a right to liberty and security. You cannot be put in jail unless procedural guarantees are followed, unless it's prescribed by the law, unless you can have your case heard by courts, etc. And again, it does not matter if you are a suspected <coughs> terrorist. You cannot be put in prison on suspicion of planning terrorism without following these procedural guarantees. Guantanamo Bay, good example at hand. Everybody has a right to a fair trial, regardless of what you have done, regardless of what crime you have committed, you have the right to a fair trial. The state can never say that you have now violated national security so gravely that you don't deserve a fair trial. In Norway we had a case uh, five years ago that I will come back to, through the terrorist Anders Bering Breivik who killed 77 people, um, most of them youths. P public <coughs> opinion called for, let's just lock him up, get him away, he doesn't deserve these guarantees. The state stepped up, provided the fair trial guarantees that he, as everybody else, uh, is entitled to. You cannot be punished unless the law says so. You cannot be sent in jail for a crime that was not a crime at the time you committed it. The law needs to specify what is punishable by the state. This also goes for issues on national security. If you do something that is not prohibited, and the state later realizes that this has a security dimension, you cannot be punished for that in retrospect. Everybody has the right to privacy. This is one of the key human rights when you discuss national security. Can, can the state listen to your phone calls? Can the state hack into your emails? Can the state uh, follow you through video cameras without telling you? How much of your electronic traffic can the state surveil and how long can it uh, keep the data, etc. You have a right to privacy, you have a right to personal life, and this can only be limited uh, to a certain extent, again, with clear procedural guarantees. This is one of the human rights that are most often uh, violated in the quest for national security. The state listens to your phone calls, they don't tell you. That's a violation of human rights. Lastly, you have freedom of speech. 
you are ent entitled to say things that the state does not like. You are entitled to say that the city government is doing wrong things, that they are uh, violating human rights. You are allowed to call for change of government. You are allowed to call for reforms. States which feel their security being threatened <coughs> tends to uh, come hard down on such speech. But again, the state has an obligation to protect and even promote your freedom of speech, enabling you to speak what you want. With these as important human rights, let me just outline very quickly some key dimensions of human rights and the state's obligation to protect your human rights. First of all, every single human right, any right you can think of, has a positive dimension and a negative dimension. This is what we often refer to as the state's obligation to respect your human rights, the state's obligation to protect your human rights, and the state's obligation to fulfill your human rights. Respect means that state should not interfere in your enjoyment of your rights. The state should not actively kill you. It should not interfere in your enjoyment of the freedom of life. The state should not torture you. The state should be passive, refrain from interfering. That's negative. <coughs> right. The state also has an obligation to protect you from threats from others. If the state knows that someone <coughs> is a concrete threat to you, to your right to life, to your uh, freedom from torture, for instance, the state has an obligation to protect you from that threat. The state also has an obligation to fulfill, and this is perhaps where national security comes most uh, importantly in, the state has an obligation to fulfill your human rights by creating a society where human rights can actually be uh, enjoyed in full without any fear, without any want. This is through training of police officers, training of military officers, training of judges. It's through budgetary <coughs> allocations, it's, it's through legislation and through other means to create a society where human rights are uh, realized in full. Human rights have an immediate dimension and also a progressive dimension. Human rights should be respected immediately when it becomes an obligation. The state shall not deprive anyone of their life. This is an immediate thing. The state cannot say, okay, we respect that we now have an obligation not to torture anybody, let's just finish torturing those who are already in prison. The state cannot do that. It's an immediate uh, obligation. But still there's a progressive dimension to it. You should do better over time. Your protection of people against threats from others should be improved over time. The state's fulfillment of human rights should be improved progressively over time. The state should always do better. The state should always strive to do better. The third dimension of human rights goes between absolute human rights and relative human rights. This refers to whether the human rights can be limited or whether they cannot, under any circumstance, be limited. Very few human rights are absolute. This goes in a sense against the basic perceptions we perhaps have about human rights as something that the state cannot uh, infringe. But very few human rights are, in fact, absolute. The prohibition against torture is one of them. The state can never torture you. The prohibition against slavery is another. The prohibition against uh, retroactive legislation is a third, etc. But when very few human rights are absolute, that means that most rights can be limited. Most rights must be balanced against other legitimate uh, national considerations. This can be done in exceptional circumstances, 
such as during wartime, during grave natural disasters, during revolutions, state coups, etc. But human rights can also be limited in ordinary circumstances. In everyday life, in perfectly stable, secure, safe society, the state can still limit human rights out of certain considerations. What are these circumstances? The possibility to limit human rights in exceptional circumstances is what we refer to as derogations, making temporary exceptions from human rights obligations. This is Article 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is perhaps difficult to read on the screen, but uh, you will probably get these slides afterwards. It says that in time of public emergency, which threatens the life of nation and the existence of which is officially proclaimed, states parties may take measures derogating from their obligations under the Covenant. There are a lot of different elements to this possibility to derogate. First of all, some provisions can never be derogated from. They are so-called non-derogable. See this in Article 4, Paragraph 2. No derogation from Article 6, which is the right to life. Article 7, which is the prohibition against torture. Article 8, 11, 15, 16, 18 may be made. These are non-derogable. Even in wartime, the state has an obligation to respect these rights under all circumstances. It cannot be any form of emergency. It needs to be an emergency which threatens the life of the nation. An emergency that threatens the existence, the further existence, the functioning of the state as such. This may be attacks on the state's political integrity, such as state coups, it may be attempts to um, secede from a state, meaning to change the state's borders, uh, declare independence through violent means, and things like that. But it's not uh, merely uh, organized crime, for instance, that does not satisfy the criteria. Terrorism has, unfortunately, you can say, been found to qualify as a threat to the life of the nation. The United Kingdom has made a derogation which has been considered valid uh, against the threat of terrorism. Derogating measures can only go so far as is necessary, strictly required by the exigencies of the situation, as the ICCPR says. You can all only derogate so far that that is absolutely necessary to prevent this threat to the life of the nation. And there are a couple of other uh, 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 principles as well, such as the uh, measures cannot be in consistence with other obligations under international law, it cannot be discriminatory, it needs to be officially informed to the convention organs. So there are a lot of different criteria, but the main one uh, is the first <coughs> three. <coughs> Some provisions can never be derogated from, such as the prohibition against torture. The threat, the emergency, has to be a threat to the life of the nation, so it's a very high threshold. And derogating measures can only go so far as are absolutely necessary. Let's take one example then, because as I said, Turkey derogated from the ICCPR uh, this summer in the wake of the large-scale coup attempt as Turkey uh, describes. This is not my words, this is Turkey's official proclamation of the derogation. Calling it a despicable attempt that was foiled by the Turkish state and people acting in unity and solidarity. And this coup attempt and its aftermath, together with other terrorist acts, have posed severe dangers to public security and order, amounting to a threat to the life of the nation, as Turkey describes. Then Turkey derogates from the International Covenant. They have a similar derogation for the European Convention, but this is the ICCPR one. They derogate from Articles 2, 3, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 17, 19, 21, 22, 25, 26, 27. This is a derogation which, if it comes, if it comes to the Convention bodies, which will be declared invalid. 
because it simply goes too far. A state cannot uh, derogate from its entire uh, human rights obligations. It has to be strictly required, and Turkey has by no means shown what is strictly required to limit all of these rights. But as it stands at the moment, this is Turkish derogation. But as I said, human rights can also be limited in ordinary circumstances. This is nothing mysterious and nothing special. This is what we simply call limitations of human rights, balancing human rights against other national considerations. This is Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a <laughs> classic example of um, limitations and which is very important in a national security scenario. Everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence, including emails, including uh, your internet history, including your phone calls, etc. You have a right to respect for your correspondence. However, there shall be no interference by public authority with the exercise of this right, except, except such as in accordance with the law, so it has to be prescribed by law, and which needs to be necessary in a democratic society for the interests of, among others, national security. So this is the state's legal basis for limiting your right to correspondence in the interests of national security. Yes, the state has a legal basis to do this, but only so far as it's provided by law. So you have to have access to a law which with sufficient precision describes when an interference in the privacy <coughs> can take place. And also, every interference with this right needs to be absolutely necessary in a democratic society. The state needs to show why it is necessary to interfere with this or that person's right to correspondence. So these are high uh, thresholds again, which means that the state cannot simply uh, interfere with anybody's right because of vague uh, consideration of national security. It also needs to be consistent with other rights, um, which is uh, something I won't go much more into. But in legal terms, we say that these are three requirements, one of legality, one of legitimacy, and one of proportionality. So these are three legal requirements the state needs to follow in order to interfere. Let's use three examples to illustrate this. This is Anders Bering Breivik, the Norwegian terrorist that killed 77 people uh, in 2001 through two independent terrorist attacks. One against the governmental uh, building, killing eight people, and one then at a youth camp for the National uh, Political Party, killing 69 youths uh, at that camp. He was sentenced in 2012 uh, to the maximum penalty in Norway, which is 21 years preventive detention, meaning that it can be uh, expanded um, at the end of his sentence. So in reality, it will be probably be in for life. But the form formal judgment was 21 years detention. He was sentenced through an open public trial. His own statements were exempt from uh, broadcasting, but uh, most of the trial was actually broadcast on live national television. There's no necessary need for secrecy in cases relating to terrorism. You can censor those parts that are likely to incite <coughs> further violence. There's no need to really keep this secret, keep this closed, etc. Norway managed to provide this man with a fair trial despite what he had done. Last year, sorry, this year, 
He also filed a claim against Norway, claiming that his human rights were violated in prison. And he won. I believe that it was wrong that he won. Uh, I believe he is not subject to torture or inhuman treatment. He has two cells, he has uh, access to all kinds of entertainment, he has great facilities. He's not tortured by any natural definition of that term. But he won in the court of first instance. He will have his case uh, tried on appeal by the uh, court of appeal next spring. You can pr protect human rights also of terrorists. You have to take certain considerations that their rights should be protected and they can be protected without affecting human, uh, without affecting national security. Second example, this is Ailan Kurdi, the hero that um, got famous and has become an iconic image <coughs> of the problems related to the refugee movement. European states now do what they can to keep refugees out, partly for reasons of welfare and reasons of strain on national uh, capacities, but also for reasons of national security. It's a trend now to close borders, provide refugees with fewer procedural guarantees, keep them out, resulting in issues like this, making it difficult, dangerous to come to Europe. Yeah. The United States has an election this autumn. This is one of the uh, promotional ads that has been placed by one of the candidates. If I had a bowl of Skittles, Skittles is a fruit uh, candy. If I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you just three would kill you, would you take a handful? That's our Syrian refugee problem. Which in a <coughs> very cynic and incredible way illustrates that's because some of the refugees may be terrorists, we will keep everybody out. One of them may be a danger to us, therefore we keep the whole bunch of them out of our, our country. And that is where national security and human rights collide head on. Because how can you deprive millions of human rights because one may be a danger? <coughs> This can be illustrated academically by the so-called black swan theory, which is a quite nice uh, way of illustrating this. The black swan theory is named after the European, um, when, after when Europeans first came to Australia. Europeans had never seen a, a black swan before because all swans were white in Europe. Therefore, Europeans had no way of imagining that any swan could be anything other than white. Coming to Australia, they discovered a black swan, something that could not be predicted, but something that clearly existed. Translated into counter-terrorism, translated into national security, this is a theory that tries to explain how we cannot simply predict the unpredictable. We cannot know what will happen in the future. It is impossible to predict the next terrorist attack. We know that there will be a terrorist attack somewhere in the world at some time. We cannot know where. We cannot know how. The only thing we can try to do is to prevent the last one from happening again. So all our counter-terrorism efforts try to uh, prevent terrorist attacks that we have seen in the past, but we cannot prevent or predict the next one. This also plays into the refugee situation. We cannot predict which one of these refugees that may be a potential danger. We cannot identify them. What do we then do? And this is a theory that in my mind explains parts of the uh, relationship between national security and human rights. We cannot let uh, considerations of national security interfere too much in human rights. Trying to prevent something from happening simply goes too far. We cannot predict what will happen. 
state's efforts to protect us from any possible danger will go too far in limiting human rights. We have to accept a certain, uh, certain risk, certain unpredictability, because it's in the interest of our enjoyment of rights. Let's end with a more pleasant uh, thing too. Human rights and national security must go hand in hand. They must be balanced against <coughs> each other, and they are necessary to uh, realize one another. You need human rights to protect your national security. You need national security to protect and realize human <coughs> rights. It's finding the balance, which is important. And states have a tendency today to go too far in promoting, protecting national security, and then disregarding <coughs> human rights in the uh, in that process.